Module 3, Investing to Improve Performance. This module will help you recognize the key activities necessary to implement interventions and improve road safety performance. Mr. Howard will start Module 3. Okay, investing to improve performance. Now, this is where we're trying to get into a little more of the application of what, in its broader sense, it's not just getting some money to fix up a piece of road or do a bit of enforcement. It's about investing to set up your management infrastructure. It's, it's about these things, essentially. Firstly, the enabling activities, the sort of threshold things you need to do, because if you don't do these, it's very hard to implement subsequent actions that rely on these things. Management coordination and decision making arrangements, legislation, data systems and the justice system itself. Road offences in some ASEAN countries are still criminal offences. That is an enormous break, an enormous restraint, constraint on effective road safety outcomes. Talk about that. Funding, promotion and advocacy and building knowledge and capacity. So what do we, what do we need to do to get those enabling things in place? And then, of course, end delivery is interventions, which we'll talk about later. If we look at the, coordinate, the management coordination and decision-making arrangements, you need decent arrangements. You've got to have, as we've talked about this morning, you've got to have some means of making people, uh, uh, making decisions, bringing people together and formulating a plan and implementing it. Have you got a lead agency? Or is it just groups of people turning up who are well, wish, are wish, uh, wishing the whole system well, but not really having direction? Partnership development, which is the flip side of coordination, and I talked about results focus. The lead agency is the agency that brings all the parties together. It has, the, it has sufficient clout to be able to bring the agencies together, but it doesn't do everything. It relies on the agencies doing their thing, but it brings people together. Now, a number of you have that. I know of a number who are looking to set, set this up, but it's extremely important that you do this. It can be difficult, but you have to work through that with your government. It needs a good secretariat to do the work, pull the people together, do the administrative tasks of getting the agendas out, getting the minutes out, making sure papers are prepared and sent out in advance of meetings to people who are coming along. Basic housekeeping that doesn't happen unless there's somebody allocated to do it. Skills, resources and sustained technical assistance. That's at the heart of a good road safety activity in any country. And the last dot point in that slide is not meant to be accusatory or denigrating anything. It's just that people find it very difficult to come together and work cooperatively anywhere in the world. Road safety is no exception. It's just that road safety relies on it more heavily than many government activities. So it's always a challenge. And it's one thing to set up arrangements, but it's another to nurture them, foster them, continue them, keep them growing and going. But it's what it's all about. If you have good cooperation, people in a room focused on the same issue, they'll come up with, with the, the best answers. No question of that. But you've got to get them in the room. You've got to get them to see that there's benefit in working together rather than separately. And they've got to leave, in many cases, they've got to leave their egos at the door when they come in. And that takes a lot of work. Good practice countries have good machinery of government in place. Um, and everybody, know, the agencies know what they're supposed to be doing. They've got clear roles and responsibilities. And that, that emerges over time. But again, you've got to keep working on that. Issues will come up and there'll be uncertainty about which agency should be dealing with it. That's got to be talked through between agencies and a decision made. So I'm stating the obvious in the last point, but you've got to have ownership, authority and accountability. Your lead agency's got to, got to be the glue that makes the whole thing work. It's got to be able to get out and get the agencies together at management level, the working group level, management level, I'll talk about these levels in a moment, and at executive level and in many countries have a ministerial coordination group as well. So we need a high level working group, a manager's working group, which is where most of the work is done in road safety, to support strategic decision making that's carried out by the, the chief executives. Just on this issue of how you kick this ball off, how do you get the agency, if you've got a problem in your country in getting a genuine 
management arrangement together. How do you kick it off? Well, there's a few stimuli you can use. One is a capacity review. The other is a strong political intervention by a senior prime minister or president saying, I want this fixed. But you need some stimulus to get it to happen. And of course, all the agencies need to rec recognise the multi-sectoral nature of this. And I know many countries where there was a reluctance to say, I need to work with another agency. And that's where the lead agency is so important. It's regarded as the group that can require the parties to come together. But it can be difficult to achieve that. and It won't happen overnight. But I think the real issue is when you see the power of cooperative effort in getting funding and getting into cabinet with a number of ministers briefed the same way and getting government support for legislation or other measures, that's the power of cooperation at that level. Potential road safety management arrangements, building on the principles we discussed this morning at national level, we want to get coordinated decision making and partnership across government. We want a multi-level decision making framework and that's all about getting better road safety results. Here's one model, it, it's an anonymous uh, uh, jurisdiction, but this is one model, one way you could look at going about it. There's your chief executives. They would probably meet three times a year as a group. And indeed, if your experience is anything like most countries, when they do meet for the first time, they, a lot of them have never met each other before. So, that's an important group. And in some countries, there's a ministerial level up, a group up here as well. But that's, that's good to have eventually. Here's the heart of the road safety effort, the manager's working group. And they need to meet about every month. Get around the table, uh, look at their action plans or their strategies, see where they're going, or indeed develop one if they haven't got one. Look at what the crash data is telling them. Be given papers and reports and recommendations on what needs to happen from their staff and from technical working groups, which are down here. These are, you know, I don't want to make this sound too formal. These are small technical working groups, probably two or three people, working on a particular issue to give the managers group some recommendations to work on. And you, you'd have uh, just put those together as you need them. In some countries, there's a technical working group for each UN road safety pillar. So you may, you may follow that model. But you've got your technical working groups, your manager's working group meeting monthly, the executive group meeting each three or four months. Here's your secretariat from your lead agency. Your secretariat supporting these groups. And that's no, it's no trivial task, that secretariat function. Yes, it's admin, but it's more than admin. It's, it's, it's management as well. It's getting the parties together, dealing with issues that will inevitably arise, issues of difference coming up with solutions. On the right hand side of that um, diagram you've got local government liaison and consultation and a little expert advisory group so that government can be sure you're getting some independent external input into what you're trying to do. And you might meet with a group with groups like that two or three times a year. And that would be the managers doing that. This group meeting with them and with the secretariat setting up the, uh, setting up the meeting bit hard to read but those boxes that's support decision making liaison and advice so this is your decision making column a lot of countries mix up decision making with consultation and, and advice and if you want to really make decision making complicated put people around the table who haven't got the same interest in the outcome as the government agencies i.e. They don't have budgetary involvement. They don't have performance or accountability requirements. And you will watch the conversation by the government agencies just dry up. They're not going to open up in the presence of those external parties. Don't mix them up. If you've got arrangements like that now, get them over into a consultation uh, column or, or, or condition, such as this here. By all means, consult with people, but do it separately to your basic government decision making. And over here you've got the support framework or column which is the secretariat. But the, the decision making is crucial. 
I've worked in an environment like this. I've seen the managers certainly developing a very close working relationship over time and even the chief executives working very closely together and saying we're the only people who are going to fix this. We own the problem. We're going to fix it. And giving their managers very clear instructions that they want concise recommendations, well thought through recommendations based on evidence and the managers have to be able to go and argue the case in front of their chief executives. But if there's two or three managers there together at that meeting of the senior executives arguing the case, it's a much uh, stronger basis for getting support. That's what I'd recommend you look at. If you have this without that, you're going to be in all sorts of trouble because this group, by meeting regularly, is constantly dishing up issues for the chief executives to deal with. Some of which they can deal with independently because it might be a, a road problem or whatever, but a lot of which they won't. And if, if this group is active, and building up issues for, for consideration at this level, it forces this group to meet because otherwise the backlog of material gets too great. And at some point you need your managers here to be talking to their chief executives about the need to get together. One of the clear messages from Manila was to do this. And, and they're critical, aren't they? I mean, if the, if the chief executives don't support this, it's, no, it's going nowhere. They are the gatekeepers. They control what gets through, what's allowed, what happens, what ministers are briefed about. We need to get them on board. And unless they've got uh, considered recommendations coming forward to them and argued cogently in some detail, they'll never be informed about the problem or potential solution. So there's the three groups we've talked about, the steering committee or the executive group, the managers working group and technical working groups. There's the role of the steering committee the manager's working group, that's the hub of your coordination. The technical working groups, that's what they're doing. And the secretariat, the sorts of things that the secretariat has to do. And it's quite a long list. I've talked about consultation and your stakeholder representation. You'll decide who they are, the, you know who they are in your country. Here are the arrangements that exist in Victoria, Australia. There's actually a ministerial council there as well sitting on top of the executive group and the management group. And there's technical working groups down here, not shown. There's also a parliamentary road safety committee. And I, I think that's an important observation. There is a group of parliamentarians, a committee of parliament, that meets um, perhaps eight or nine times a year. And they run public inquiries into a road safety issue, something really contentious, for example, drug driving or drink driving. And that process is a really it's a terrific way of getting public input. They have public hearings. The road, the, the road safety agencies make submissions. Other groups in the community make submissions. It gets a lot of coverage. It's a transparent process. It's a very effective way of getting issues on the agenda. And that, that parliamentary committee's got a very proud record. It was, the, it was that committee that recommended seat belts be made mandatory in 1969 in Victoria, the first place in the world. So, you could never get a decision like that up by bureaucratic recommendation, a world first. But with a parliamentary committee process, public ventilation of the issue, lots of public discussion, it's possible. And it's a very good process. We often overlook the benefits of getting the community fully involved. And if you've got a parliamentary function that can run inquiries, it's a really good thing. So ministerial council, the various ministers that are part of that, you've got these notes. The road safety executive group, which is the steering committee, I won't dwell on this. The management group, similar to what uh, we've discussed. And a reference group or advisory group. And, and I think this is interesting. Five basic mechanisms underlying effective coordination. Agreement on what the major issues are and the priority areas for action. So th th this is the agenda for that decision making structure. And again, that's something a management group could put up to its chief executives and say, do you agree these are the key things we've got to do? And here's our recommended top five for the next 12 months. Suitable structures for interagency interaction, we've talked about that. Joint planning and implementation of action programs. You know, the, the, the chief executive should sign off on the action plan or the strategy as a group meeting together and then monitor it. Get reports two to three times a year on how it's going what the issues are, what help is needed 
by their people to overcome barriers and blockages and so on. Suitable structures for interagency interaction, we've talked about that. Joint planning implementation of action programs. You know, the, the, the chief executive should sign off on the action plan or the strategy as a group meeting together and then monitor it. Get reports two to three times a year on how it's going, what the issues are, what help is needed by their people to overcome barriers and blockages and so on. Procedures for regular review of progress and information feedback, as I've just said, and how the agency stays involved over the longer term. I've talked about parliamentary engagement. Is Victoria's approach transferable? I don't know. It would be different in different places, but essentially the management arrangements are. You need somebody to do the detailed work, the technical working groups across agencies. You need somebody across the agencies to get together the management group and process that information and put it in a form suitable for chief executives to consider. You need chief executives to get together and decide what they want more information about, what they don't accept, what they are prepared to take forward to ministers together. So I think, I think the approach is eminently transferable. Uh, if you've got a better method, by all means, proceed with that. But this does work. Properly nourished and supported, this works. A big issue for everyone is legislation, data systems which support so much of the enforcement and penalty and deterrence in a, in a society, and the justice system. And uh, you know, there's all sorts of anomalies, aren't there, with our justice systems? In some cases, people prefer to go to court because they'll get a lesser penalty than if they take an infringement by the side of the road. Well, that's sort of half right and all wrong. The judges, it's very hard to get to the justice system, as is proper and right, to brief them on what the purpose of road safety legislation is. We used to find that we could go to the justice conference. They'd have an annual conference of judges every year. And while we couldn't go and sit down and talk to them and say, this is what we're trying to do, we'd like you to support us in your decisions, that's not appropriate, it wasn't considered appropriate, they were quite happy for us to come to the annual conference and present on what we were doing when we introduced alcohol interlocks. There was great support from the judiciary because they had drunks from country towns that they knew well. The local magistrates knew these drunks quite well, but what could they do with them? They'd take their licence off them, they'd keep driving while they were drunk. The interlocks gave them a very powerful tool to cut that link between drinking and driving. So there was good support, but even so, we couldn't go and talk to them. But we spoke to them at their annual conference, question and answer, it was very effective. So there have to be links between the road safety agencies and the justice system. Tricky territory, but you've got to find a way to build a link. Because at the end of the day, they're human beings, they need information. You can't be seen to be telling them what to do, but you've got to be seen, I think, to providing information for them. So the legislative function involves reviewing the scope, how adequate your legislation, developing what you need and all of, all of the issues around. Legislation development is crucial to road safety growth. Every session of Parliament in Victoria, we had a road safety bill and the Parliamentary Council would come to us and say, where's your bill for this session? I'd say, oh, well, we've got this and that. Some of them were just tinkering, but every, uh, the two sessions a year of Parliament, we always had a bill for road safety. It's too valuable a tool not to use. It's an extremely valuable tool. And when you go to a politician and say, we've got a little provision here to amend the legislation, and if we do this, we'll save this many lives, how can they say to you, we don't want to do it? Now, if you want to say people can't get their licence till they're 25 or something, they're not going to agree to that. But if it's a reasonable step forward, there's a very good chance they'll back you if you've got all the other agencies supporting you. Our biggest challenges weren't with the politicians with legislation. They were with the other agencies, particularly the Justice Department. We had a lot of hurdles to get over to meet their requirements to be seen, to be respecting human rights, respecting justice policy, which is all appropriate. But they are issues to be managed and barriers to be overcome rather than blockages to progress. So the legislation thing is extremely important. Often a need to consolidate legislation. It tends to grow a bit like topsy. In every 10 or 15 years, you should look at consolidating your legislation into an updated Road Safety Act. Get traffic offences out of a Crimes Act if they're a criminal 
uh, matter in your country at present, move to get them into a Road Safety Act where they're treated as road safety offences. Uh, because then it's much easier for your police to be issuing lots and lots of infringements for speeders or for non-seatbelt wearers or for helmet wearers. A bit tough when they'll get a criminal record, a criminal conviction for not wearing a helmet. And that's a problem in a lot of countries in, in the region. And securing time for road safety, if there isn't a tradition in your jurisdiction of having a bill every session, uh, you need to start that process. A bill every year would be good. You've got to look at your legislation and say, where is it letting us down? Where are the weaknesses in our legislation? Where are the things we ought to be doing? What, where are the things that are stopping us from implementing beneficial change? So be proactive. You don't have to sit there and say, whereas some problems emerge with this act, that'll come up all the time. But look at what you need to do to match your legislative settings to the problems that exist out on your network. And of course, legislation enc encompasses land use planning systems, uh, your road vehicle and user safety standards and rules, and all the compliance regimes. It's a very broad view of what legislation means. It's regulation and standards. And we, we overlook this too much. We sort of rush to do something out there when in fact so much of what holds us back is this stuff. This is the hidden road safety challenge. And you've got to crack this open and start working in this space. You don't have to do everything immediately, but start working in this space with your justice people, with your agencies, steadily work away at getting some things to happen. And of course you must have your licensing database linked to your courts and police offence database to establish a demerit point system, to establish a linkage between offences and licensing. And that's easy to say, but it's, it's a big task. And again, you need to start as soon as you can on doing that. The third dot point, back office capacity. If you're going to go into electronic enforcement, and those of you who have, you know the big volumes of data that you have to deal with. And that will overwhelm any sort of manual process. You've got to have back office electronic processing. You've got to think of how police will check images in that automated process. You've got to think of the, of the right people have to question the infringement and see the photograph, if need be. All of those things have been dealt with in jurisdictions internationally and can be addressed. But it does take time and, and effort to do it. But it's very important. You've got to make sure your legal framework is readily enforceable. Have the police, have you made it as simple as possible for the police to enforce the law? Because if you haven't, they've got other things to do. They're not going to go through all the hoops in the world just to get a single infringement uh, given to, to a driver. You've got to make legislation enforceable. And streamlining it, as I said, you need ad administrative court systems. I've talked about working with the justice system, gaining support for court penalties, uh, which are supportive of administrative penalty levels. So this is where you can go to court and get a lesser penalty. That's what a waste of time. You know, that's silly. That's, I don't know what, what that's doing for our society. I think this is important too, involving the justice system and developing proposed initiatives. Probably not the judges, but the, just, the, the justice department. You must get them involved. Because the worst thing you can do is get to the end of a process and they say, whoops, we can't do that for A, B and C. You need them involved early on. Let's see where all the rocks are. Let's get all of that on the table. Funding, uh, I've got a session on funding tomorrow where we can focus on it uh, in more detail. Just as we are grasping to understand the road safety problem and how we deal with it best, that's what this is all about, our political masters, our senior bureaucrats, they've got less idea than you have of the problem. And that's why there's not much funding. I think funding will flow if the arguments are put to government about the potential scale of the problem and the benefits that would flow from those interventions. Promotion and advocacy, promoting road safety to the gatekeepers, as I call them, the chief executives, the ministers, the chief ministers. Uh, building the conversation and sharing the language, really important. You know, we talk in a little bubble about the sort of jargon that we have. We've got to get out there and start spreading that around. I call it the barbecue language, around the, the little barbecue, the family barbecue or the 
the family picnic or whatever, being able to talk about road safety in down-to-earth terms. NGOs, of course, do a great job, and sub-national governments. I mean, many of you have got, you've got state governments, provincial governments, you've got local governments, um, you know, and that's, that's another layer again, layers again, of road safety activity that you have to foster and encourage. So much road safety activity happens down here. The enabling stuff and the ideas happen up here, but a lot of delivery happens at local level. And we've got to be alert to that and, and put the effort into that support for that delivery. Getting the messages out about the scale of the problem, we need to tell them the scale of the problem. and Tell them the number of people who are killed and injured every year. And if everybody's life affects 100 people, that's a lot of people being affected in each of your countries every year. They're the tales we need to tell to change the understanding. We can, we can actively reduce it, that's the other thing. Learning by doing, I had a session on um, demonstration projects, and it's all about pipeline projects, demonstration projects, some of the things that you would hope will come out of this process. And really, we all learn by doing. You know, we've all learned a bit out of textbooks and learned a bit of the theory, and, but the real learning comes from doing it. And once you've done something and you've made a mistake, particularly, or you've done it well, it sticks with you forever. And I would encourage all of you to think about projects where people can learn by doing, because it's the only way you'll get change. And that means smaller scale demonstration projects in corridors or areas where all the sectors work together. You can pilot management arrangements across the agencies without anybody getting too upset because it's only a demonstration project. And then within a few years, that becomes the accepted way of doing things. If you do the right things and you monitor it and you evaluate it and you report on it. We need funding, of course, and we need to energise support. Building knowledge and capacity, well, Knowledge development, there's a lot of this knowledge around internationally. How can we accelerate it in ASEAN? And the demonstration project model is the best advice I can give you. You can still look at the, what the international research tells you, but you can do a bit of your own too, and you can do a practical project on the ground. And I won't talk about interventions, we'll do that. We need to look at what we now do to talk about that particular module.